Good. Well, thanks again. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session six, the final session of the South Carolina uh, SBDC Intellectual Property Webinar Series. On behalf of the entire webinar team, um, I want to uh, wish, wish to thank you for joining us today. My name is Tony Del Campo, and I am the technology commercialization uh, uh, business consultant for the SBDC, and I will moderate today's session. Okay. Oops. For those not familiar with the South Carolina Small Business Development Center, it's a statewide organization that serves the needs of both urban and rural businesses. SBDC consultants work with small businesses at all stages of development by offering free consulting assistance to help existing businesses grow, as well as assist entrepreneurs and innovators who wish to establish a startup. The SBDC provides not only one-on-one -on -one consulting, but also offers useful educational and training seminars such as these IP webinars to inform businesses and entrepreneurs so that, they, so that they can be positioned for commercial success. We're very pleased today to have a special guest and presentation as our final IP session. Uh, presenter today is Elizabeth Doherty. Ms. Doherty is the Eastern Regional Outreach Director for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, commonly known as the USPTO. And in that role, Elizabeth carries out the strategic direction of the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the USPTO. Engaging with the community, Ms. Doherty ensures that the USPTO initiatives and programs are tailored to the region's unique ecosystem of industries and stakeholders. In this session, Ms. Doherty will discuss the mission of the USPTO and how it supports US innovation ecosystem which is such an important driver of our economy. In addition, Ms. Doherty will discuss uh, the USPTO, how the USPTO has responded to the pandemic by offering specific COVID-19 uh, res resources to provide relief and assistant, assistance to patent applicants. As the moderator, I'll be managing the chat box that you see at the corner of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box and we hope to have time at the end of this webinar to respond to your questions. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth for today's presentation. Elizabeth, I'll stop sharing my screen to allow you to. Great, uh, fantastic, yeah. Tony. And thank you Great. for that warm welcome. My thanks to Tony and the entire team at the South Carolina the SBDC. It's my pleasure to be with you today. It's my honor to be with you. And I am super happy to help bring home this six part series. Uh, I hope to leave you all energized and uh, excited, excited to enter the world of invention, innovation and entrepreneurship. Whether you're just getting started or somewhere in the innovation ecosphere, moving along that journey, I want to let you know that in addition to your friends at the Small Business Development Center, we at the USPTO are here to help you. And let me start today by telling you a story about a South Carolina inventor, a fantastic South Carolina inventor, and that is Jerry Barber. Jerry Barber is a resident of Greenville, South Carolina, and started his career as a high school administrator. Now, this was an era in Ohio, not in South Carolina, but you may think that sounds like a pretty simple beginning. Now you may also think that Jerry had a leg up because he had a degree in physics and in chemistry, which certainly helps in inventing in some spheres, but he was also just a guy who looked at things differently. When he looked at a problem, he didn't just agonize over a problem, he looked at ways to solve that problem. He, in fact, uh, after leaving the academic world of being a high school principal, went on to start, own, and operate the second largest amusement ride manufacturing company in the United States. And in fact, you may have enjoyed one of his creations. He was known for creating the free fall amusement ride that can be found in almost every amusement park and large carnival worldwide, such as Disney's Tower of Terror or Cedar Point's Demon Drop. Now, keeping up with Jerry, you would come to find out that Jerry now has over 60 patents in his name and his new passion, something he began in 2009 and is continuing to pursue to this day, is uh, the Barber Wind Turbines. 
he is looking to revolutionize uh, the world of wind turbines and providing that alternative energy source, particularly to individuals living uh, in islands and locations where they can benefit from this technology. Why do I share Jerry's story with you? To tell you that you too could be a Jerry. You too can be that person who looks at a problem and seeks a solution. Whether it's a problem you're experiencing, whether it's one that your family is experiencing, or perhaps your larger community or even the world. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into uh, the resources that we have for you at the US Patent and Trademark Office. And to do that, I am going to share my screen and jump into some uh, presentation slides. Now I will move through some of these relatively quickly, um, but again, we will have time for questions at the end. Just to let you know a little bit about the US Patent and Trademark Office, because we are one of the best kept secrets of the federal government, unfortunately. We are an agency that started in 1790. Our work is in fact written into the US Constitution. Uh, we are written into the Constitution because of the foresight of our founding fathers who knew that to create America as a strong and industrialized nation, we needed to protect the writings and discoveries of our authors and our scientists of our inventors, of those who were creating creative works of the mind, protecting them through intellectual property protection. The USPTO, in fact, is America's innovation agency. We are committed to fostering innovation in economic growth and creating a reliable, predictable, high quality IP system. And again, it's something we've done since the first issuance of a US patent in 1790, up to the issuance of patent 10 million. And this year alone, we will issue patent number 11 million which is really remarkable when one stops to think about the amount of creativity and intellect that is captured in those patents. Uh, as I said, uh, we are actually, in fact, grounded in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts, securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Those are limited periods of time and those uh, give our inventors and our authors the ability to exclude others from using their intellectual property without their permission. Now, why is this important to you as a business owner? Well, I suspect many of you have attended the previous sessions in this six part series and you are probably already on a good and firm foundation as to the importance of intellectual property being core to every business whether you're opening a new nail salon or creating a business bringing a technology to commercialization, intellectual property is at its core. And whether that's through a patent, a trademark, a copyright, or a trade, trade secret, or a combination of those, it is key to a successful business. Why is that? IP is attractive to investors and buyers. Just like real property, it can be bought and sold, it can be licensed, it can be given away. By protecting your creative works through uh, intellectual property protection, you can deter infringement lawsuits because you are putting the world on notice that you are the owner of this property. Of course, intellectual property can increase leveraging power. And as I said, it's a property right that can add value to a company's assets. Think about any time you might've watched that uh, television show Shark Tank. What do the sharks always ask that individual coming before them? Do you have a patent? Do you have a trademark? What is your intellectual property portfolio? They want to know the value of what's been invested in a company. What value is, is there that has been protected? And of course, intellectual property is a global property. It's a business strategy. Even though intellectual property is territorial and protected by the country which issues those rights, we are in fact in a global economy and intellectual property is global. Now, looking at it from a 30,000 foot level, IP intensive industries are critical to our nation as a whole. They create jobs, they provide uh, income, uh, they result in gross domestic product, and they create higher paying jobs. So again, businesses that have IP at their core are likely to provide, again, more jobs and higher paying jobs, which is critical. And so something to keep in mind as you start and build and grow your business. As I know has been touched on in the preceding parts of this series, uh, you are probably all very well aware that there are four basic types of intellectual property protection. Patents and trademarks, protected and issued by the US Patent and Trademark Office, 
copyrights issued by the U.S. Copyright Office, which is a part of the Library of Congress, and of course trade secrets that are generally protected by contract law and the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Um, as I said a moment ago, when you are starting building and growing a business, one should always be cognizant of what types of intellectual property you may be creating. What is it you are putting in your quiver, in your portfolio of intellectual property that brings value to your business? Are you in fact producing something which can be protected by a patent? Are you producing something, uh, an indicator of goods or services that can be protected by a trademark? Are you in fact uh, sealing some type of artistic expression in a fixed medium, one that has sufficient creativity that it can be protected by a copyright? And of course, do you have anything that's of value to your business that can be maintained as a secret? It's also key, and I'm sure it's been addressed prior to our conversation today, that these various forms of intellectual property not only protect very different things, but they protect for very different durations. Patents being for perhaps the shortest duration. Patents uh, for utility patents protect for uh, 20 years from the date of filing. Design patents, 15 years from the date of issuance. Trademarks are incredibly valuable because nearly every company, if not every company, has something that's protectable by a trademark. Again, it's the indicator or origin of goods and services. Those can be good forever if continually used in commerce and protected with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, but also renewed with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Now, that is for a federally registered trademark, that circle with the R in it. Of course, there are state and uh, common law trademarks, but again, we're talking about federally registered trademarks today. Copyrights. Copyrights are good for 75 years plus the life of the author, so an extensive duration. And then, of course, our trade secrets can be kept uh, any, is for as long as they can be kept a secret. They bring value to the company. They can be incredible intellectual property, again, because that duration could be potentially forever. Uh, this chart, again, just goes through the various types of intellectual property protection, provides some examples, and the duration of that protection. Uh, I will provide these slides to Tony and his team to share with you. Uh, I know this one may be a little tough to read on the screen. So what is a patent? We've, in fact, already touched on it. It's that right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the claimed invention without the owner's permission for a limited period of time. What is a trademark? Uh, again, it's, uh, it is a source and an indicator of the source of goods or services, and it allows consumers to identify that source, to know and to go back and appreciate and participate with a brand owner time and time again. It encourages trademark owners to provide good quality services and goods, uh, and, and enables them to build goodwill in their, in their brand. A copyright, again, is that original work of authorship um, that is placed in a fixed, tangible medium. And that trade secret, again, is any information that derives economic value from not being generally known or ascertainable. I think one thing that oftentimes people don't know about trade secrets is that it can be a wide variety of things, formulas, patterns, compilations, programs, devices, methods, techniques, processes. I know we all oftentimes think of the recipe for Coca-Cola or the recipe for KFC chicken but there's many things beyond just mere recipes that can bring value to a company. But so the topic we're here to discuss today is USPTO resources, and I am happy and excited to bring these all to you. And we have a lot of them. And first and foremost, it's our website. Now I know everyone has a website, so you may think, oh, what's remarkable about this website? Well, it has so much content, we're gonna walk through it together because it is so rich with information that it's hard to find that information. I'd be the first to admit that. Starting with our homepage, we always have an inspiring journey of innovation, um, telling the story of someone who is, uh, has walked the path of being an inventor or being an entrepreneur. Um, today, in fact, we are featuring Arlene Simon, who is a young inventor who has uh, developed a blood marker test to determine when people are uh, rejecting uh, bone marrow tra uh, transplants. Um, a remarkable young inventor. She's also an author and a STEM advocate. We also, along our bottom toolbar, I would bring your attention to our COVID-19 Relief and Support Assistance Center, uh, our Demystifying Patent System Toolkit, which is in our Expanding Innovation section, 
uh, artificial intelligence, which is a key uh, area of initiative for us right now. Uh, the two main takeaways I'd love to leave you with on our landing page, our homepage, is that top learning and resources pull down tab. That is your best entrance into education for inventors, entrepreneurs, startups, kids, and teachers. And then, of course, second, um, but equally as important, is finding direct resources in your geographic location. There's two ways to get at that. By hitting either of those, you will uh, jump to a map of the United States and be able to pick South Carolina or whatever state you might be residing in at the time where you need the assistance. Talking about our expanding innovation hub, uh, this is drawn to a, a current and pressing initiative of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and one that we are doing and participating in with industry, academia, and government. And this is expanding the world of those who see themselves as inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs. As our previous director would like to say, we are competing against the world with one hand and four fingers tied behind our back. If we don't have more diverse populations, and when I say diverse, I mean diverse ethnically, diverse by gender, diverse by geography. We need more diverse individuals and organizations participating in invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And that's why I am encouraging and incentivizing you today to be part of our world's greatest challenges. Be part of the group of people that are addressing them by offering your diversity of thought, your diversity of experience, because we can all benefit from it. Um, in this Expanding Innovation Hub, we do have a wonderful slide set I'd draw your attention to uh, under the Demystifying the Patent System. It really walks you through uh, how the patent system works and how one interacts with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. As I mentioned, one of my favorite places to send people to is the Find Help in Your Area page. And this uh, map shows you that uh, we have broken the United States into five regions. My office is located in the Alexandria headquarters. Uh, when we are open, that headquarters is open to the public, and we welcome you to come and visit us there. We have the National Inventors Hall of Fame Museum on our campus, as well as a number of resources that you can take advantage of in person. Uh, now, certainly my team, as well as the rest of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, is all working virtually, and we have been from the start of the pandemic. So you can reach each and every one of us uh, if we can be of assistance. So if you were to jump to the South Carolina page and the Finding Help in Your Area page, you would find a page that looks like this. And it provides to you a wide number of resources. And at that page, you would find, uh, when you click on the uh, Get Free Patent and Trademark Legal Assistance, you will find the pro bono program that is available to individuals in the state of South Carolina. And it's actually a pro bono program that is headquartered in Georgia. It's the Georgia Patents Pro Bono Program. We're going to talk a little bit more about the pro bono program in just a moment. Um, you will also find their IP clinics, which we'll talk about. But there are IP clinics located at NC Central University. Uh, their School of Law has a clinic that assists uh, under-resourced inventors. You will also find information here about the PTRC that is located at the R.M. Cooper Library at Clemson. There, there are librarians who are eager to help you in understanding and appreciating intellectual property and also gifted in helping you to conduct a high-quality patent or trademark search, which can be incredibly valuable as you begin down the path. Um, there's also an inventors network of the Carolinas. Inventor organizations are incredibly beneficial for joining with others who may be able to help you problem solve, who may be able to help you walk through the path of being an inventor or innovator. Just as an SBDC or the USPTO, it is a resource network of individuals and you may be able to connect there with other individuals who can help you avoid some of the pitfalls they've experienced or also share in some of the successes that they've shared in as an inventor. One of the great places to get started, and this is from our learning and resources pull down tab, is the inventor and entrepreneurs resources. There we have uh, really uh, coalesced a large kind of one-stop shop of information to know as you're getting started as an inventor or entrepreneur. We have patents, trademarks, assessing your IP, and information about scams. And let me hit these last two. Assessing your IP. When we started this conversation today, I talked about the four types of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. 
while you may be getting your head wrapped around what those are and how they are applicable, you may still be questioning what you have in the business endeavor you're pursuing. Under the Assessing Your IP button there on our page, we have a IP assessment tool, which is an online tool, which by taking a quiz, which takes anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes, you can, through answering a series of questions, identify what type of intellectual property or types you might be creating in your business endeavor. And it provides some information for you. Um, I strongly encourage it if you're just getting started and not really sure about what types of intellectual property you might be creating. Protect yourself. We have an entire section here about avoiding being scammed. Unfortunately, there's a number of uh, organizations that are out there preying upon inventors and entrepreneurs getting started. We've all seen those late night commercials, got a great idea, let us help you get a patent. Now, some of those companies are very reputable, others are not. So we do provide some information as to questions you should ask when considering uh, working with an invention promotion company, asking about their rate of success, asking for examples of individuals they've helped. Um, so I would strongly encourage you before going with an invention promotion company to visit that section of our website. Similarly, we have a page for startup resources, and it does in part duplicate some of the resources on the inventors and entrepreneurs page. But again, it also offers some additional assistance. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to, to stop at both of these as kind of a one stop shop for getting started. For those of you who are visual learners, uh, I encourage you to visit our uh, YouTube page. On our YouTube page, we have a wide video library of uh, recorded events from uh, previous conferences and programs. We also have some content that has been developed solely to be placed in our video library. Uh, particularly those of you who are looking to secure a trademark, I would uh, strongly recommend to you that you look at our trademark information network. It's a series that's been put on by one of my colleagues, Jason Lott, who is also a SAG registered actor. So he does a remarkable job in hosting what appears to be a real live newscast about trademarks. Um, so those are particularly engaging and I think a great way to learn the ins and outs of trademarks. Uh, on our webpage, we also have a subscription center. And the easiest way to find this is just by simply typing the word subscription into the search box on our homepage. When you arrive at our subscription center, you can sign up for one of 12 available subscriptions. And in fact, you can sign up for all 12. Even as an employee, I have signed up for the majority of these subscriptions because what it does is it drops into your inbox anytime there is new news to share with you. We do not spam you, we do not give away your email address, and we merely provide you information about the particular content that you have requested to receive information about whether that's patents, trademarks, copyrights. Um, there's a wide variety of subscriptions here and I encourage you to sign up for one or as many of them. Again, they are all free. Our events page. This is one of my favorite places to send people. And this is where we have events listed um, nearly every day of the week, certainly Monday through Friday. And on given days, we have multiple programs going. And one of the best things about these events is they are my four, favorite four letter word, and that's F-R-E-E, -E, free. Um, this month alone, we uh, have had nearly 30 programs and they're on a wide variety of topics, patents, trademarks, protecting your IP in China. In fact, my team and I have a program that is coming this Thursday, uh, two days from now, and it is the first in a series and it is on wine and IP. We are going to teach about intellectual property through the lens of wine and the wine industry. And we are kicking our series off with a remarkable program on, uh, uh, for Black History Month on wine and individuals who are diversifying the wine industry. Just as we are trying to diversify in the area of invention and entrepreneurship, uh, we are juxtaposing that against individuals who are diversifying the wine industry two areas of endeavor which have typically not been incredibly diverse. So I, we hope you'll tune in for that. And you can find that on our USPTO events page. And that is from the learning and resources pull down tab. So who do we have individual wise to help you at the USPTO? 
Well, of course, whoever is assigned to your patent application or your trademark application is certainly a good place to start if you have a question regarding that specific application. The patent examiner or the trademark attorney who is assigned to your file is there to help you. However, if you have not gotten started or you have another question and it's in the realm of patents, we have an Inventors Assistance Center, which is staffed by remarkable individuals who have had lengthy 20, 30, 40 year careers at the US Patent and Trademark Office, who are now retired and are coming and giving back to the community, answering your question. They love to get your questions Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 8, and welcome any question that you have. Even in fact, sometimes our patent attorneys call our Inventors Assistance Center because they've got a question too. Similarly, we have a Trademark Assistance Center, which also offers assistance to um, those of you who have questions about trademarks. They too are open 8.30 to 8 and answer any question and additionally take email questions as well. Although I would strongly encourage you to just pick up the phone and give them a call because they love to talk to you. We also have something called our Pro Se Assistance Program and they accept phone calls and emails as well. This is a program designed to help that independent inventor who is going the road alone. Uh, as was probably discussed in the program about patents, you are not required to use the assistance of a patent attorney or patent agent in securing a patent. However, it is strongly encouraged. Seeking a patent is a complicated legal process. It is the US federal government issuing you a property right, so there is a level of complexity involved. So you are encouraged to use a patent attorney or patent agent. However, uh, if you don't want to, for whatever reason, whether that's financial or you want the adventure, then by all means, we have the Pro Se Assistance Program, which specifically takes calls and offers help to those who are uh, not assisted by an attorney or agent. Our U.S. Patent Pro Bono Program. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the program that covers South Carolina is the Georgia Patent Pro Bono Program. Uh, as a result of the American Invents Act of 2011, Congress urged the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to collaborate with legal organizations across the nation to offer pro bono assistance to under-resourced inventors. Congress did not want there to be kitchen table or garage inventors that did not bring technologies forward because they were financially unable to do so. So with that, the USPTO uh, did just as was directed and worked with uh, legal organizations across the nation to stand up pro bono programs across the nation. Some are state programs, some are regional programs, and in fact, some of the programs accept people from outside of their region or outside of their state. So I mentioned that just in case you go to that Georgia pro bono program and they say that they cannot assist you because uh, they have too many applicants already. I just throw that out there. There are certain requirements for participating in the pro bono program, one of which is that program participants must have an income 300% below the federal poverty guidelines. So that differs from area to area. Now with that, um, you also have to have, meet a couple of other requirements, one of which is you have to have skin in the game. You have to have either taken a uh, course on our website or filed your own provisional patent application to show a recognition that you understand the endeavor you're undertaking, that you have some appreciation for what a patent is and what you are pursuing. You also have to have more than a mere idea. You have to, in fact, have an invention that is commercially viable because these resources are so limited. We want them to be for those individuals who are going to take them and then build a, start and build and grow a small business which, you know, with any luck and hope, we would want it to grow into an industry and in fact, employ individuals. So uh, you have to have more than a mere idea. Now, you might be asking yourself the question, what does that mean more than a mere idea? And I'll give you this example. I have an idea and my idea is that I would love to build a time machine. I would love to go back in time and meet individuals like Abraham Lincoln, Harriet Tubman, significant people in history. I would love to meet these people and get to know them um, more than just reading about them in a book. Now, can I actually build a time machine? Unfortunately, no. I, I would love it if I could. So I have a mere idea. I do not have an invention. So hopefully that, that clears up what it means to have more than a mere idea. As I said, the pro bono program is located across the nation. 
Law school clinics are a corollary to the pro bono program. And as I mentioned, there's the closest law school clinic to you in South Carolina is the North Carolina Central University School of Law. These law clinics uh, accept individuals and provide pro bono legal services, either in patents, trademarks, and sometimes both. You can find these on our website and it's a similar process in working with the pro bono program, although the requirements aren't quite the same. Oftentimes, if someone makes too much money to take advantage of the pro bono program, but they are still financially under-resourced, oftentimes a law school clinic might be willing to take them on in pursuing their patent or trademark. Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. Uh, and I think uh, you had one of the speakers in one of the previous seminars who was from the local Patent and Trademark Resource Center. These patent and trademark resource centers are a wonderful resource in your community. Uh, and the one that you have there in South Carolina is the RM Cooper Library at Clemson University. As I mentioned previously, there there are uh, a librarian and perhaps more than one librarian who is able to assist you in creating a high quality patent or trademark search. They are often uh, also very gifted in other areas of intellectual property and often, uh, in fact, offer courses and classes uh, to those in the community. Reduced patent fees. I mentioned this um, because it's something that uh, one should be aware of when filing a patent application. When filing a patent application, one comes in as a recognized entity. That's either a large entity, small entity, or micro entity. If you can take advantage of being a small entity or a micro entity, you should certainly do so. Large entity are our large companies, our IBMs, our Qualcomms, our large companies. Um, our small entities are those that, according to the Small Business uh, Agency, have less than 500 employees or are a nonprofit organization. If you qualify as a small entity, you have the opportunity to pay fees reduced by 50% in almost all instances. As a micro entity, you would pay fees reduced by 75%. Now, in order to be a micro entity, you first must meet the small entity requirements. So you must be an individual or a small business of less than 500 employees or a nonprofit. You have to have filed no more than four previous applications and provisional patent applications do not count towards that amount. You have to have an income not greater than three times the median income and you cannot have assigned your technology to someone other than a micro entity. So you cannot have assigned your technology, for example, to an IBM, to a Qualcomm, to a large entity. Um, so if you can qualify as a micro entity, you do have to file a certification statement. But again, if you can qualify, know this going in, if you can qualify as a small or a micro, please make that evident, make that clear in your application so you can play the, pay those reduced fees. Any opportunity to save money is a good opportunity. Uh, for those of you who are going the patent process, I want to make sure you're aware of something called Track 1. Track 1 is an opportunity to expedite your application. And in fact, if you file your application Track 1 prioritized examination, the USPTO makes a pledge that you will get final results in one year or less. And in fact, I've talked to uh, applicants and attorneys who have received a patent in as little as three to five months. Now this does come with a cost. As a micro entity, it's an extra thousand dollars. As a small entity, it's two thousand dollars. As a large entity, it's four thousand dollars. But in certain instances, this may be necessary. This may be money well spent for you or your company. If you have a competitor that you need to get out in front of, uh, if you need to get your uh, product to the market fast, if you need to get that protection in an immediate fashion, track one may be something that you want to take advantage of. So I, I just bring it to your attention. Other USPTO resources, again, these are resources that are available on our website, things that we've just pulled out to bring to your attention, things that we've talked about a little bit in the preceding slides. But again, I will be providing these slides to Tony and his team to share with you. So let's talk about the COVID Response Resource Center, which you saw was there available on the bottom tool, toolbar of our homepage. Um, and I'm going to talk about it, but we're going to talk about this relatively quickly, although I've got a lot of materials here. Uh, I'm going to go through them. So hopefully they'll stick in your mind and be a place that you want to go back to and check out again. Uh, this slide just again shows you that the COVID response uh, resources and response page is available from the bottom toolbar of our homepage. 
It is a resource center because we have gathered a great deal of information there. When you land at our resource center, you are going to find jumping off places to find patent and licensing resources, innovation incentives, trademark counterfeiting and consumer fraud information, international updates, and contact information for the USPTO. So these are the four basic things you're going to find when you first jump to the resource center. Looking first at the patent and licensing resources uh, section of the resource center, you're going to find information about the patent pro bono program, which you and I just discussed. And you can also find that by typing pro bono into the search box of our homepage. You're going to find information about the Patents for Partnerships platform and other special resources for inventors and entrepreneurs. And that's the inventor and entrepreneur page that I showed you just moments ago. So what I really want to focus on here in this Patent and Licensing Center is the Patents for Partnership platform. So let's turn ahead to that. Uh, in the Innovation Incentives, uh, which is our next column on our Resource Center, uh, there's information about our prioritized examination pilot program, which we will talk about here in just a moment, the voluntary early publication of patent applications, and the deferred fee provisional patent application program. Um, these all come with some complexity, but we'll try and hit each one of them individually. In our trademark section, you will find a trademark examination prioritized program. We'll touch on it quickly. There's also additional federal government resources and how to report fraud and counterfeiting. You may say, why are you focused on fraud and, uh, fraud and counterfeiting? Well, of course, fraud and counterfeiting are the scorch of intellectual property. And it's particularly in times like the pandemic that we see it really fire up and expand. Um, the amount of counterfeiting going on with respect to PPE, with respect to vaccines, uh, is continuing to grow each and every day. Um, so we do like to continually remind consumers about uh, looking out for fraud and reporting counterfeiting. So we just bring that to your attention again, as we do each and every day. International updates, we won't spend a great deal of time there, but there is uh, information on how the rest of the world's intellectual property organization are dealing with COVID, uh, any updates that are available, and links to other patent offices. So we, again, we won't spend uh, much time on that. So let's talk about the Patents for Partnership page. This is a searchable repository of patents and published patent applications related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, what this is, is this is a place where you as an inventor, an innovator, a small business can position a technology that you have that is related to solving some aspect of the pandemic that you are interested in offering for license or sale, or you're interested in collaborating with others. The last I checked, we had over 900 technologies listed in this partnership um, page. Now, we did pre-populate it with some information that was already available from other sources, such as the government laboratories, uh, the Association of University Tech Transfer Managers, but we have had a huge outpouring from our community of individuals with technologies that they are looking to collaborate on to solve some aspect of the pandemic. We think this is exciting because perhaps once we are out of the pandemic, perhaps we could stand up a similar platform for showcasing other technologies. So that's certainly our hope, but right now we are solely focused on technologies uh, resulting in some type of cure or solution for the pandemic. In order to participate, um, to place a technology, either patented or published, you have to use the IP Marketplace platform submission form. Um, and you can find that on our website. Again, you can find the link here in the slides that you'll be provided. But we encourage you, if you have something that you would like to bring forward and offer to the community, the USPTO does not serve any role in making connections. We are not the, the, the matchmaker in this situation. We are merely posting uh, content that has been provided for us uh, in that others can then view to make collaborative opportunities. Let's talk about the patent prioritized examination pilot program. Uh, I just shared with you a moment ago our track one prioritized examination program where we pledged that we would uh, give you a final determination in a year or less if you paid an extra fee. We have cre created um, specifically for patents and we'll talk about trademarks in a minute 
um, the opportunity for prioritized examination of patent applications that qualify for a smaller micro entity, remember those individuals who qualify to pay reduced fees, that you can have prioritized examination without that typical fee, $2,000 or $1,000, if you have a technology, and let's get to that, if you have a technology, and you can see it here, that the application must contain one or more claims related to COVID-19 and must be subject to an applicable Food and Drug Administration approval. Not that you have received that approval, but that it would be subject to an applicable FDA approval for COVID-19 use. So again, this prioritized examination pilot is open to small and micro entities. If you qualify because you have a uh, technology that is subject to an applicable FDA approval for COVID-19 use, you can participate in this program by applying to the program and not have to pay the expedited fee. Our goal is to have a final determination in these applications in six months, not even a year, in six months. To participate, you have to fill out the pilot program form uh, and file your application using our electronic filing system. It's a great opportunity if you can help, if you can make a difference and you have a technology that is applicable to FDA administration approval for COVID-19 use, please bring it forward if you're a smaller micro entity and would like to expedite that to get it out, to get that patent issued so it can help people more quickly, please do so. Again, here's the pilot program form. Um, we are accepting uh, up to 500 approved applications uh, in this pilot program. Uh, we are not near to closing out the program. The last I checked, we still had 200 or 250 uh, available spots in the program. So we certainly, while we've received more applications than that, only approximately half have qualified for participation in the program. But again, we strongly encourage you to take advantage of it if you can. Similarly, we have a trademark prioritized examination program. We will accept petitions to advance the initial uh, examination of application for marks used to identify qualifying COVID-19 medical related products and services, and we will waive the petition fee. So uh, this allows an expedited initial examination and it will take place in approximately two months if the petition is granted. Trademarks has not placed a cap on the number of applications that can be participating in this prioritized examination program. But similar to the patent prioritized examination, it has to be for marks used to identify qualifying COVID-19 medical related products and services. Um, as I said, you can find more information there in our COVID Response and Relief Center. Uh, you must first file the application and then file a petition to the director that includes the assigned serial number. No fees required. Just as in the patent prioritized examination program, the fee is being waived because we want to expedite these applications. We want to incentivize uh, individuals to bring forth technologies and marks protecting companies that are looking to solve these greatest challenges. Again, you have to use our trademark application system. Um, and there's a great deal of information on our website about this program. Deferred fee provisional pilot program. So those of you who uh, are considering filing a patent or have filed a patent, you may have filed a provisional patent application. Let's keep in mind, and as was uh, likely discussed in one of the previous sessions, that provisional patent application does not result in a patent. It's a one-year placeholder with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, puts something on file with the USPTO, allows you to begin talking to others, seeking financial assistance, uh, perhaps commercializing your product with a, a, a low level of protection. Now, that protection really doesn't adhere until you have that issued non-provisional patent uh, that arrives from a non-provisional patent application but a provisional patent application is a great place to start in many instances. What this COVID-19 program is, is the USPTO will permit applicants to defer payment of the provisional filing fee until the filing of a non-provisional if the applicant agrees to publication of the provisional on the office's searchable collaboration database. Now, with this, uh, I don't want to discourage anyone from using this program if you have a technology related to solving the pandemic uh, and you are willing to bring it forth and share it. However, keep in mind, in general, uh, provisional patent applications are maintained in confidence uh, and that's as a benefit to the applicant. 
So you need to uh, think twice, think twice about before participating in this deferred fee provisional pilot program. And I point that out because the fee for filing a provisional patent application is relatively small. Uh, $70, $90, it, it is a small amount. So by deferring payment of that fee, what are you gaining? Well, you're losing the opportunity to keep your technology in confidence until you're ready to file that non-provisional patent application. So I, I just issue this with a word of caution. I don't wanna discourage you from using this, this pilot program and disclosing your technology, but keep in mind, that's exactly what you're doing. You're disclosing your technology and perhaps you're disclosing it earlier than you really would have liked or maybe really should be. Now it is uh, just as the patent prioritized uh, examination pilot, it has to be for a product or process related to COVID-19 and subject to applicable FDA approval. Not that it has been approved by the FDA, but it would be subject to FDA approval. Uh, one must use the pilot program form. Uh, and uh, again, there are FAQs on our website. I would strongly encourage you to, to consult with a patent attorney or patent agent to read these FAQs before considering participating in this pilot program. Um, stakeholder support, I just wanna to bring to your attention that we have done other things as an agency to help our customers and stakeholders during these challenging times. Uh, we have been able for our patent trial and appeal board and our trademark trial and appeal board go to remote interviews and virtual hearings. Um, so that work has not slowed down. That is still available to our stakeholders. Um, there is uh, a, wide, a, a great deal of information available on our website about how one can participate if you wish to participate in a virtual hearing, if you are called upon to do so. International unity, as I said, we won't spend a great deal of time talking about the international aspect of uh, COVID relief uh, efforts, but leave it to say that the international intellectual property offices across the globe have all stood in support of one another in trying to offer information and assistance to applicants. Uh, we have also been able to provide waivers for uh, things that would be uh, complicated during these uh, challenging times, one of which is waiving the original handwritten signature requirements for many of the signatures that are required. And you can now file plant patent applications electronically. Um, initial patent term extension applications can also be filed electronically, uh, as well as we have extended the time period for petitioning certain rights of priority or benefit. Uh, I would leave you before we uh, turn to questions uh, with, again, some upcoming events that I'm excited to share with you. One of which is, uh, again, this Thursday, I mentioned it earlier, our Wine and IP Black History Month program. We also have another series that we are running every month throughout the entirety of 2021, and it's called Do You Know at USPTO? It's a uniquely curated uh, webinar series on education and information about intellectual property, oftentimes highlighting specific offices within the US Patent and Trademark Office. In honor of March Madness, we will be for focusing on sports and trademarks uh, March 17th. And then our subsequent, our second in the series, uh, Wine and IP, will be focusing on Women's History Month and women in the wine industry, uh, and also focusing on some of their inventions and innovations in our March 24th edition. With that, I wanna make sure that all of you have my email address, the email address of my team, uh, which is at Eastern Regional Outreach Office at USPTO.gov and the phone number for my team as well. Uh, we welcome your calls, we are there to assist you. And if we're not the right place in the US Patent and Trademark Office, we are happy to get you to the right place, uh, depending on what your question or issue is. So we are there to assist you and welcome your calls, welcome your emails. And of course, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I am going to stop sharing my slides uh, so that we can turn to questions. I know we've allowed a little bit of time and uh, are happy to engage. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, really, very, very informative. I hope everyone, the audience uh, enjoyed it as much as I did, that's for sure. Um, so I ask the audience to please put your questions uh, in the chat box. I think that we have somebody, we have one question here from Christine. 
Um, I'm interested in the lo she asked the question, I'm interested in the location of the network of inventors. Is there a link? Uh, so great question, Christine, and thank you for asking that. So if you go to the find resources in your area, and again, you can find that on our homepage in one of two places, either go to the state resources page or go to the find resources in your area. You'll uh, land upon a map of the United States along with a listing of the states select uh, South Carolina and in that South Carolina page you will find inventors organizations in your area and the link should be there. Now if for some reason you can't find that please feel free to send me an email and I will get you connected. Um, there's a large number of inventor organizations located across our nation and some in fact are our larger national organizations that do provide resources to inventors and innovators uh, again, offering free programming, offering collaborative networking. Uh, we have one in my local area, uh, which is kind of the Washington DC, Maryland, Virginia area, and they are called INCA, Inventors Network of the Capital Area. And they do remarkable things for their inventor cohort. Um, Thank you. Okay, well, a question from uh, Roland. Is there any way I can get the slides <laughs> for the previous webinars in this series? And uh, yes, Roland, you can. Uh, uh, Carolyn Strange, who is in my office, will handle that uh, question. Will, will handle sending out those slides. I think she, she's requiring that uh, you fill out the survey following uh, the the the, uh, the presentations, which you may have already received. But in any case, that's that's the requirement from our side is that you fill out that presentation. Yeah, Tony, um, sorry, that survey. I'm going to assume that Roland also wants my slides, but I don't know. He asked about the slides for the other parts of the series, so hmm, I, I wonder. I'm sure you. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he he, he does. Uh, let's see here. Uh, are there are there events that were shared, region specific? No. So that, that's a so great question. Um, so the events that are currently listed on our website right now are all, because we're in a virtual environment, are all uh, actually nationwide now, uh, events. Um, you will see that the events are lifted, listed oftentimes in different time zones, and that may be because they're being hosted by one of the regional offices located on either Denver, or Detroit, Dallas, or San Jose. But those programs are open to anyone uh, across the globe, but certainly across the nation. Uh, the programs offered by my team as well are open uh, nationwide. Here's an interesting question, I think, from Earl. Can a patent application that is started traditionally be moved to the fast track method by paying additional fees? Uh, and, and Earl, that's a great question, but the answer is unfortunately no, no. <laughs> um, not, without, not without refiling. Uh, because in order to keep to that strict time frame, in order to come to a final resolution in 12 months or less, it needs to be on the fast track from the very beginning. So it needs to be, put, the USPTO needs to be put on notice with the filing that this is going to be expedited. The fee needs to be paid along with the application filing fee so we can start from the get-go. And with that said, there is a responsibility both on the part of the office and the applicant there are requirements. We pledge that we will respond and provide office communications within a certain period of time. The applicant is under uh, equally as restrictive response times. So where traditionally an applicant might have um, three months to reply to a communication from the US Patent and Trademark Office, under the track one, they have 30 days. So one, uh, one not only has to pay this extra fee, but you need to be aware of the fact that you are also pledging to participate in an accelerated fashion. And there are certain other requirements too. So um, one should really investigate before taking that. But again, if you need your patent issued quickly, it's a wonderful way to go about it. So the applicant has to keep the pressure on his or her attorney to make sure that they respond in a timely manner. For sure. Which I'm sure Doug and Jeremy do all the time anyway. So. Certainly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I have a question uh, regarding that fast track application. I, I, I've experienced, I think, one or two in my career. Uh, but when you say that it, 
you they're look that they pledge to have a final response in one year. What it, what are you saying? Are you saying a final determination of whether there's that the patent is eligible or the application is eligible for for uh, issuance, or is it something else? I mean, yeah, what does that really mean? So when we say uh, when we pledge for a final determination, that means effectively the prosecution will be concluded within one year, and that's either we're issuing you a U.S. patent or we are telling you that final determination that, listen, you are, your road here is done unless you wanna take it to appeal or you want to refile your application with a request for continued examination or you want to let your application go abandoned. I see. So, so within that year, there's numerous back and forths because sure. it is a process of communication and collaboration between the applicant and the office. So there will be numerous back and forth but that pledge is for a final determination that, listen, we're, we're done. Okay. Uh, and I have another question. Let's see. There's, uh, if you don't mind, that has to do with the, the uh, provisional, let's see here, the COVID-19 prioritized patent program. Uh, and you mentioned that it has to be obviously COVID-19 uh, related. And that there's a separate question to that. Who makes that determination? Because there are, you know, technologies out there that could be construed to be related to COVID when it may or may not be, if you know what I mean. So who makes that determination in terms of whether it's COVID-19 related? So those are reviewed uh, when they're received within the office. Um, so keep in mind, it's not just that they have a technology related to uh, solving the pandemic, but they have to have been subject to an applicable FDA approval for use in treating COVID-19. Okay. So whereas the Patents for Partnership platform accepts a wide range of technologies that could address some aspect of the pandemic, whether it's, um, you know, uh, a new type of gloves or uh, a new mask or a vaccine. A diagnostic. That, exactly. That the Partner, the Patents for Partnership platform accepts a wide variety. Those do not have to be uh, uh, subject to an applicable FDA approval. To participate in the prioritized patent pilot program, they have to be subject to an applicable FDA approval for solving COVID-19, which, which limits the sphere. And as far as applicable FDA approval, that would include emergency use application. Sure. Uh, emergency use authorization. Sure. Okay. Now, again, you don't have to have already sought FDA approval. It just has to be that your technology, if it does go forward, would be subject to FDA approval. Okay. Very good. Anybody else have a question for Elizabeth? Let's see here. Uh, one from Rochelle. Ro Rochelle, I have a new title for my speaker materials that I want to use next week for a speaking engagement. How do I protect the title? Okay, it keeps moving on me. <laughs> for the speaking engagement, how do, I, how, could, how do I protect the title that I plan to also use on products? So uh, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm, that, I'm is, a little confused by the question um, because it, you know, it could be going to the question about uh, uh, receiving a trademark, trademark with respect to copyrights for the materials themselves. Um, the title of a presentation uh, in the presentation itself would be something more likely to be covered by a copyright, which of course is a sent off is a self authenticating uh, property right. Um, and again, is there enough creativity in the content that it could be copyright protectable. Now if it's the, the name of a product that would go more to the issue of a trademark. So I guess I'm unfortunately a little confused by the question. I guess I would say, as, as Jeremy has, all, has said during these series, is please uh, consult with your friendly neighborhood patent attorney for there questions you. like that. <laughs> uh, and let's see here. Um, you, Jeremy says you got it. <laughs> uh, let's see, any other questions? I, how about this, the wine and IP events? They're very interesting. Are, are they supplying uh, samples 
<laughs> that would certainly make them more engaging, wouldn't it? We, uh, we had thought about trying to position them uh, at the end of the day so we could also, you know, have a wine tasting, a virtual wine tasting with the event. That just uh, added a certain level of complexity. And because it I'm is sure. a wide <laughs> webinar, that made it challenging as well. So maybe in the future, but we will be hitting all aspects of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, um, geographic indicators, such an important conversation with respect to wine and food. Um, the, the labeling of wine is uh, a very interesting aspect. Um, so we, we really think this is gonna be an engaging series, particularly uh, for those who are in the wine industry, but even just for those of us who enjoy wine. It sounds like a lot of fun, that's for sure. And I also would like to put a plug in for the, uh, for the National Hall of Fame Center. I've been to that, to that center and it's really, really quite interesting. Uh, fantastic place if you're ever up in the DC area. Uh, well, thank you, Kelly. Definitely, definitely go to it. Of course, I don't know if it's open now. So unfortunately it's okay. not, but when our facilities reopen to the public, it most certainly will be. And it really is a hidden gem. Yeah. Um, we encourage you to come out to Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, we're located right off of Old Town Alexandria, which is a really charming historic area of Virginia uh, in between Washington DC and Mount Vernon, which is in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, come in, visit us, use our public search facility, visit the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and be sure and stop in to see me and my team. We'll take you to coffee. We can talk all about intellectual property. Sounds um, like fun. We hope that when things reopen to see uh, you and all of your friends there, Tony, all of you. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll ask the audience, are there any more questions uh, that, you, that you may have for Elizabeth? Well, it doesn't look like we're getting any other uh, last call for questions, anybody else? Uh, but again, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for that great presentation. I think it's fantastic. And I know there were a lot of slides, but it seems like they, they went very quickly and the content really came over well. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And thank you again. It was an honor and a pleasure to be here with you and your audience today. I and I, I strongly encourage that if my, uh, myself or my team can ever be of assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. And that goes for all of the resources that I shared today, our Inventors Assistance Center, our Trademark Assistance Center, Pro Se Assistance, the Pro Bono Program. These programs are here to help facilitate people in invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We want to help support you. Um, so we, we look forward to working with you. Very good. Thanks, Elizabeth, again for your participation in our webinar series. It was, I think, fantastic. And uh, if there's not any other questions, I think, Carolyn, we can end the, the, the session. Yes, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, have not typed your name in the chat box to confirm your attendance, please do so now. I will be sending out the post-event survey probably within the next 30 to 45 minutes. And then those that uh, respond to the post event survey and I'll give everyone until Monday, I'll be sending out the presentation slides from this event on Monday, which I believe is March the 1st. And um, Roland, I will get in touch with you to share some information on all of the previous events so you can take advantage of some of the um, videos that we have posted. Okay, so um, the Thanks, only Carolyn. person that I am missing their confirmation is Beth. So Beth, um, if you could share with me your last name so I can confirm your attendance. I believe that is the only person that I am waiting to hear from. Great. So once again, thank you to everyone for participating in today's uh, webinar, this final session. And for those that have stuck with it for the entire six sessions, uh, I, hopefully they have been productive for you and informative. Uh, and if uh, myself or any of the IP team can help with some of your questions, please uh, give us a shout out and we'd be happy to help you. And with that, I'm going to leave uh, and end the session. Thank you so very okay. much, Tony. Okay, Carolyn. Thanks a bunch. Take care all.